The following program is underwritten by the Nevada Irrigation District. Since 1921, providing clean and healthy drinking and irrigation water to more than 24,000 homes, farms, schools, and businesses in Nevada and Placer counties. I'm your host, Lou Sitzer. This is Nevada County Television, NCTV Interviews, Channel 11. Thanks for watching. We have a historic program today, and if the music would be turned down, it'd be easier to talk. Thank you. Um, the, um, the guest today is uh, Tim O'Brien. Welcome, Tim. Thank you, Lou. Thanks and for having us. It's great. Uh, we, we enjoyed preparing the show uh, because um, it's a great event. It's the 30th annual Airfest for Nevada County, and Tim has been organizing this event since 1999. I've been say? chairman since 1999, yes. And mm -hmm. so what does that mean, being chairman? Well, basically, you uh, have a vision of what uh, kind of an air show you want to put on, and you gather all the people who know how to do that, uh, be it air operations and uh, sponsorship and volunteers and setting up the different venues for the air show, and then you basically gather them all up, have a meeting, and let them all do what they do best. And um, about when do you start preparing for this? Typically uh, at the end of uh, December or January of that year, so it's about a six-month process preparing a big air show like this for this area. And it's scheduled for July? July, what's July the date? July 6th and 7th. We have a big band show uh, dinner dance on Friday evening the 6th, and then we have uh, an air fest uh, all kinds of airplanes flying and everything on the uh, holiday on the 7th. And what, what uh, generated the idea of doing an airfest? Well, the events hosted by the Golden Empire Flying Association, they started as a group of pilots for social purposes in 1968 at our airport. Uh, they always had a pancake breakfast and a fly-in where they basically invite pilots from other airports to come in and they have a swap meet, they maybe have a couple of food vendors, and it's a social gathering that's free to the public where the folks can come up and meet pilots, take airplane rides, and get familiar with the airport. In uh, 1996, one of the members, uh, Julia Amaral, uh, decided to make it go really big. She actually got sponsors, she got uh, performers, uh, high-end pilots, she raised the money to uh, make it more of an air show, and uh, thus, as the GIFA is a nonprofit organization, we were able to take the proceeds from that event and award scholarships, teaching young kids how to fly, sending them to the EAA convention in Oshkosh. Uh, many of those kids have gone on to uh, Embry-Riddle Aviation University to become pilots as a result of that. So, so this has generated uh, a lot of interest over the years. And um, I was wondering if you could spend a couple of minutes talking about the history of the airport. I know we're going to do a show on this because mm -hmm. uh, Tim is a great history buff, both with airplanes and with trains. So we're going to come mm -hmm. back uh, a number of times and get more involved in the history, but give us a brief kind mm -hmm. of overview of the history of the airport before we go to the Airfest. Sure, the airport uh, was the uh, product of the Idaho Maryland Mines Corporation. Uh, uh, Errol McBoyle, who was in charge of the mine during that time, sought to improve the surrounding properties that were owned by the mine, and the Loma Rica Ranch was also one of those. Uh, he constructed the airport in 1933 for the purpose of flying gold from his mine straight to, to Mills Field, which is now San Francisco International, and the San Francisco Mint. 
and he did that between 1933 and uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor, which essentially closed the mines. Uh, at that time, the airport was closed um, and remained abandoned until 1953 when Charles Litton Sr. moved Litton Engineering Labs to Grass Valley. Uh, he bought the airport property from the McBoyle estate, improved it as an airport, uh, put the runway back in, as well as 18 um, basically industrial sized lots to encourage business to uh, operate from Nevada County with an airport. He then gifted that to the county and the county uh, ran it as the Nevada County Airport. At the same time, the uh, air attack planes that you see flying over, the Borate bombers we used to call them, a lot of the techniques in aerial firefighting were pioneered at this airport during the 1960s. And um, I remember the old World War II bombers brought in from the boneyard and the bomb bays taken out and the retardant tanks being put in. And as a little kid, that was very impressive. And as you know, since then, the airport has grown to become a, a very nice airport as far as uh, safety for the community because of the air tankers, uh, as well as user friendly for businesses. A lot of jets and uh, charter planes and so forth operate out of there. So in terms of the activity now present in the, the airport, how would you describe it? You know, how active an airport is it? How, you know, how many planes, uh, how many people use it, that sort of thing? Well, it's a very busy place. As you know, during the summer, it gets a lot of use from the, uh, from the Grass Valley Air Attack Base, CAL FIRE and the U.S. Forest Service. Um, I know back in 1968, uh, the average takeoffs and landings per day um, from private users averaged about three to five. Now it runs in spurts between 170 to 220. Per day? Per day, yeah. That's huge. Correct. And there's a lot of folks up there who own airplanes, who keep them in the hangars. There's a lot of folks who build their own airplanes in those hangars and, uh, and fly them out of there. And some of those you'll be able to see at the Airfest, as well as on the program here today. So why don't we go ahead and look at a video that was prepared in 2001. So it's uh, slightly outdated, but uh, there's so much going on that we'll be encouraging you throughout the program to um, to visit uh, the airport and to uh, essentially go there during the Airfest. So now as we, as we look, uh, the, this is a description of the Airfest as it happened in 2001. Yeah, and it's very similar uh, today actually. We, we bring a broad range of airplanes from uh, historic warbirds as you see here to experimentals to what we call classic airplanes. Uh, our attendance usually sees, you know, uh, about 60 to 80 airplanes, and uh, we've enjoyed uh, the company of, of five to 8,000 uh, fans who come up and watch the airplanes fly and uh, participate uh, in the activities. Um, these airplanes are very exciting. Uh, they're very loud. They're, they're fun to take pictures of. Uh, they're very historic. And there's just a lot of activity. You can take rides in either vintage airplanes or, uh, or normal airplanes. And so uh, I remember going up one year and taking a ride myself. That was pretty great. Uh, and, and how accessible are these four rides? Well, there's uh, a number of fixed base operators up there who will, who will take you on an airplane ride just about any time you want to. Uh, as far as during the Airfest, there will be three uh, private planes, like the Cessna or the Beechcraft type. We also will have a couple of uh, vintage airplanes, one of them a twin engine Warbird, as we call it, it takes eight passengers, another open cockpit biplane, so there will be a wide uh, range of rides you could have up there. Nevada County is one of the most beautiful places to fly over On behalf in of the Golden Empire Flying Association and Experimental Aircraft Association Chapter 1175, Welcome to the 24th Annual Nevada County Air Fest. My name is Tim O'Brien, the chairman of this year's event. And what you're going to see here today is a wide variety of airplanes from the experimentals to the Forest Service fire suppression demonstration to warbirds, plus a whole lot of neat activities on the ground. <laughs> On Friday night, we have a USO dance in one of the local hangars. We have Don Trico and his Moonlight Swing Band, which is a 20-plus piece band, all dressed in uniform, 
We backdrop it with Warbird airplanes all around the back, so you get all of the beauty of seeing a USO dance with all the airplanes, the sound of, of music that comes from World War II, Glenn Miller era. do is we recreate the famous Glenn Miller Army Air Force's swing band or service band uh, that was popular both stateside and then later on overseas during the war. Many of these tunes, uh, some of which you have seen with the air crew singing, uh, haven't been heard live literally since the war. We really have a blast doing this music. Wish we could do it all the time. It's the best thing we do all week. Much better than our regular jobs. I really enjoy it because I'm actually able to recreate a bit of history. And it's so much fun for us here to do that because we get such a uh, response from the audience to see all the seasoned citizens out there who can really recall what it was like to live back then. Even the microphones. The microphones are all from the 30s and 40s, and the vocalists are using ribbon microphones that you see in all the old pictures. So we try to really even produce the same sound, which may even include the same static, but it's all a very highly authentic experience. We've got everything there except Bob Hope, so it makes a great evening on Friday night to come, enjoy the dancing, have dinner, and just uh, be a part of the Moonlight Swing event. When you start out at the beginning of the year, we usually start in uh, about January, and we, we want to locate all the airplanes that we need to come to the air show. We concentrate primarily on warbirds and invite those so we have a cross-section of warbirds. Try to get one of every type of airplane that we can that'll fit into our airport. The other airplanes that we get are airplanes that offer something interesting for the air show. And most of those people will come voluntarily. And we have a formation group that comes. We get a helicopter, CDF, so we get a big mix of airplanes and we try to get those all together so that when you come to see the air show you see a big variety. This is a tremendous event. Uh, you can see the energy and the entertainment. Uh, it's phenomenal uh, what has, coming, uh, has been in the past and what's coming up. This is going to be an event Friday, July 6th. Right, Friday evening, July 6th, beginning at 5.30, we'll have the Moonlight Swing Big, big Band Show, as you saw on the camera there. And this is a 22-piece uh, exact replication of the Glenn Miller Army Air Forces Band of World War II. And they went around to all these military bases and uh, what became USO shows, entertaining the troops and so forth. And we try to create that same atmosphere on Friday night uh, with all the World War II airplanes around. We encourage people to wear that period attire, which many of them do. And uh, the whole thing is going to take place under a big top, a big tent up on the airport ramp. And we're actually going to get some of the warbirds to fly during that time. So you'll be out there with, you'll have this catered dinner. You'll have the bandstand, the big dance floors. It's a very social event. And uh, you'll have planes coming and going, taking off. We've also got some 40s uh, vintage automobiles that'll be on display, maybe a few military vehicles. So we try to create that total patriotic atmosphere mm -hmm. 
that was so present in the 1940s. And about how many people uh, do you expect to, to be there for the evening event? Uh, in 05 when we did this we had about 900 people and we'll probably have every bit of that, maybe a thousand this time. The, uh, the big crowd. It's a big crowd. It's yeah. a festive crowd yeah. though. And, uh, and up on the airport there's plenty of room. Uh, parking, um, we'll be able to park some people on the airport and also down on the streets, but we have a couple of trolley buses that will stop and pick you up on your way up to the ramp and get you up to the main gate and so forth. So uh, it's very user friendly, but a very festive event. And this uh, evening event is actually divided into two parts, the dinner and the dance. And if you're not interested, let's say, in, if you're already taking care of your own dinner, you can come later for the dance? That's correct. Uh, the dinner and social hour begins at 5.30 and the big band show begins at 7.30. So if you wanted to come and just listen to the music and, or, or dance, uh, then 7.30 to 10.30 is the time for that. It's great. So um, I encourage you, obviously, this is going to be a wonderful community event. It supports good causes. Uh, some of the money generated goes for scholarships for kids. Uh, let's take a look at some of the uh, aircraft that uh, has been here in the past and anticipate coming again. Mm -hmm. This is the opening ceremony that takes place on Saturday uh, of the event. That's the uh, Civil Air Patrol Color Guard. Uh, we have a national anthem singer and uh, one or two of those airplanes will go up and fly the colors um, for, uh, for starting the air fest in that fashion. Some of the other airplanes, uh, oh we have, uh, the first thing we've tried to fly are the CDF aircraft and uh, actually this picture here goes back to Friday night. Now this is an example of the dinner dance that we have. <laughs> went yeah. by quickly. It's going to be it longer was, than that. It's going to last a little longer than that, yes. This is the Moonlight Swing Band, and this, this is very much how they set up at the airport uh, with uh, vintage microphones and professional stage, everybody in uniform. Uh, very incredible uh, musicians. Very entertaining. You know, <clears throat> I used to think I knew how to dance until I saw people come to this event uh, much older than I am who really know how to dance. And uh, so after dinner, there's a, a very nice social time. We have two big dance floors, one of them uh, courtesy uh, Music in the Mountains. And uh, people get out and they jitterbug and foxtrot and all those other fancy d dances. And the, as I said, the entire thing is uh, themed around patriotism in the, the, the good old days of, of after World War II, the Glenn Miller Big Band era and uh, this shows some of the airplanes that we have on display out there. Um, and at the close of the evening, we start the next day at the Air Fest. Uh, we try to fly the CDF aircraft early in the morning because as the afternoon goes on, the likelihood that they're going to get a fire call and have to operate on fires is, is very intense during the summer. So if there's no working fires at that time, we start off at 10 o'clock sharp and the, uh, the CAL FIRE U uh, U.S. Forest Service tanker base will demonstrate their 1,000-gallon uh, S2T tankers as well as talk about the uh, coordination that goes on between the spotter plane and the tanker planes uh, during fire suppression operations and uh, we're very lucky to have them in our community. The base is also operated by the U.S. Forest Service and uh, they occasionally will fly these helicopters uh, sometimes for firefighting and also for observation and fire spotting uh, and it's a very impressive demonstration and along with that they will have a complete open house where you can go up and ask questions. The next kind of flying is uh, the experimental airplanes. Uh, we have a group at our airport called the Experimental Aircraft Association and that is a nationwide group who uh, supports facilitates the building of your own airplane in your own garage and uh, chapter 1175 of that group is located here. We have a lot of volunteers and pilots as a result of that. In fact, they will be hosting the pancake breakfast uh, that takes place on Saturday. And uh, this is a couple of our local guys. Now they built these airplanes in their own hangars up at the airport and you'll, uh, you'll see them out flying formation, doing a lot of formation practice over the area on, uh, on, on clear mornings, and they're going to demonstrate all these different types of airplanes for you at Airfest. Moving on uh, to some of the other ones, these are also home-built airplanes. They're very high-performance uh, aircraft. The one in the lower section was built by uh, 
Arnie Luders of Grass Valley, it's uh, capable of over 400 miles an hour. It's actually turboprop powered. Um, how, how does somebody build a, a, a home-built airplane? Do you order this thing and it comes in the mail unassembled? <laughs> well, uh, almost like that. Uh, they have, uh, they get the plans and a partial kit, which consists of instructions, uh, key airframe components, uh, the fiberglass wing panels, fuselage, and all those things. And you assemble that, and, and the average, I think, for most of these guys, it takes two to three years to build one of these things. But you're covering all aspects of manufacturing when you're making these kinds of airplanes. We also have the classic airplanes. If you were around during the 1950s and 60s, you saw a lot of these. Uh, the old Cessnas, Beechcrafts, uh, Aerocoops, Navions, old planes that, uh, that uh, ran through the skies during that period. Call them classics now. From there we go into the uh, World War II trainers. This is actually a pre-World War II um, um, Ryan training aircraft. It has two open cockpits and a five-cylinder engine that sounds a lot like a Harley flying through on by the sky. <laughs> And uh, these were very nostalgic type airplanes used for training pilots in World War II. From there we'll fly the, what we call the advanced trainers. These are the AT-6 Texans. We have uh, one of those based right here in Grass Valley. There's a couple of others coming from Auburn. We actually have a category where they race these airplanes at the Reno Air Races uh, over in Nevada. And uh, they race them. It's a good race because all the airplanes are completely stock. Uh, next, we have uh, another version of the advanced trainers. These are the T-28 Trojans. There's a, a couple of those based in our area. These are what we call uh, thunder in the sky. When these airplanes go by, there's a lot of sound. They fly by at about uh, nearly 300 miles an hour. They're capable of those speeds. And a lot of aviation ambiance in the air, if, if you will, when these aircraft are going by. They're very impressive. Um, because of the close proximity of the runway to the viewing area, there's great opportunities for people to take photographs of the airplanes and, uh, and actually get down and meet the pilots and maybe even step up into the cockpit or one or two of them um, when they land. Truly, uh, the most exciting of the airplanes would be the World War II fighters. This is the legendary P-51 Mustang. Uh, we have at least four of those coming to Airfest this year. And these are the high-performance uh, fighter planes that basically uh, uh, took command of the skies over Europe and in the Pacific, uh, helping with the victory during World War II. They put out about 2,000 horsepower and will fly at speeds in, in excess of 400 miles an hour. This particular one here is a P-51H model. It's one of the last models, and it's the only flying H model of, the, of its kind in the country today. Other aircraft in, uh, include some that represent the Navy. This is the F-4U Corsair, very famous fighter of World War II. Only a handful of those still around in the world today, and we're lucky to have this one flown by Chuck Wentworth uh, coming to Grass Valley. Equally rare is the Hawker Sea Fury. This was the British uh, carrier-based Navy fighter of uh, World War II. This is flown by Ellsworth Getchell, and he puts on a very impressive series of flybys. We'll also have some of the post-war uh, 50s era jet trainers. This is a, uh, these are BAC 167s. They are um, British uh, uh, training jets that were utilized after World War II and during Korea. They were also used as attack jets by various countries and uh, we'll be flying those uh, over Airfest as well. And of course we're going to show you the latest in uh, civil aviation travel. We're going to bring in a Gulfstream uh, G4. Uh, we did some flybys of that last year, courtesy of uh, Tourjet, which is uh, a company that brokers uh, rides in those. And uh, we're going to have that here, as well as some of the, the, the newest Cessna and Beechcraft airplanes. And so we, got, we, we transitioned from the home builds to the very old to the very new. So how many planes and pilots would you say come in for this event who are not residing here with well, we actually invite uh, around 25 pilots who have the very special airplanes because we have to pay to uh, provide fuel and rooms and everything. These are very expensive airplanes to operate. So we invite these particular 25, and that's the P-51s, the Corsairs, et cetera. And for that, we get sponsorship. 
Uh, beyond that, we advertise in aviation magazines and, uh, and uh, many of the other pilots just show up. And so we, we average between, uh, between 60 and 80 airplanes usually when we do a big air fest on the airport. And how many additional aircraft are there at the airport? Um, right now, I'm not sure exactly how many aircraft are on the ramps. It seems to me around 200 that reside there, but most of them are in hangars now. And then the resident aircraft, we move to another end of the field to facilitate the uh, display airplanes that are coming in. So this is really something, I mean, uh, who, people who've lived here a long time may still be unaware of the fact that the airport is so active. Well, the airport is off the beaten path uh, for the most part in Nevada County uh, with relation to Grass Valley, Nevada City. You see the airplanes going over all the time. Um, but there's not really a lot of opportunity unless you're involved with the industrial park or flying in general to go up there. Uh, a lot of folks will take their kids up and uh, go watch the tankers come and go, like my father did back mm -hmm. in the 1960s. And, um, but as far as being center in the community, it's off the beaten path. So a lot of folks, when they do go up to the airport, are very amazed at what they find. Yeah. And uh, uh, it always surprises me to hear of jets coming in. Do we have the capability and, and how did that happen that we can accommodate jets now? Well, there was a, a large uh, airport improvement uh, that took place in the late 1990s that lengthened the runway, made the taxiway, taxiways bigger. And, uh, and that was able, they were able to facilitate private jets coming in. And these are corporations who fly executives up here and so forth. I know that uh, you want to be sure to mention some things towards the end of the show, and this is a good time to go ahead and do that. Thank you very much. Uh, the Airfest would not take place without uh, incredible generosity from the community. And uh, this year's event is presented by a very generous uh, Richard and Beth Landis, uh, himself a former P-51 pilot from World War II. Uh, the Myers Investment Group of Wachovia Securities and the Union Newspaper are uh, major contributors and, and uh, presenters for us. Uh, we also utilize a lot of uh, volunteers and local businesses that make this a truly a community event. Uh, with that is uh, Ward Systems, the Beam Easy Living Center, BNC True Value, Rebe's Auto Parts, and I would also like to thank the large number of volunteers, people who really know how to make this event happen. Uh, Air Boss Gary Gilliatt, whom you've seen. Glenn and Linda Ward of uh, Ward Systems, they really know how to throw a party. Also, Lindy Beatty, uh, Bruce Marlowe and the Marlowe family, taking care of all the ground operations. Uh, very proud of those people. And, um, and uh, we likewise, it should be another very successful event because of their efforts and support. So we want to remind people that this is going to be July 6th, the evening of, uh, for the dinner dance, mm -hmm. and July 7th for the air fest. And uh, if people want to um, get tickets, where do they go? Uh, both SPD markets in Grass Valley, Nevada City, the Beam Easy Living Center in uh, Grass Valley, and the Nevada County Airport Office. And you want to get those tickets pretty soon because the dinner dance usually sells out. Well, thanks a lot. It was a wonderful pleasure having you here, Tim. We hope to have you back. Please watch NCTV um, as we continue to do historic and meaningful cultural and educational events. Thanks for watching. The following program is underwritten by the Nevada Irrigation District. Since 1921, providing clean and healthy drinking and irrigation water to more than 24,000 homes, farms, schools, and businesses in Nevada and Placer counties. <laughs>